On July 17, 1955, Walt Disney opened the gates to his Magic Kingdom. There were five lands in which guests could enjoy the magic and imagination that Walt had dreamed of. Main Street, USA, a nostalgic land depicting the 1900s in which the vehicles, props, and shops mimic those of the turn of the century. Adventureland, a thatched jungle that captured the beauty and danger of nature's tropical terrain, with rapids and wild animals at every turn. Frontierland, a dusted Wild West wilderment of stagecoaches, mule pack rides, a towering steamboat, and the feel of an era long gone. Fantasyland, a charming land that captured the whimsicalness of Walt Disney's imagination and allowed guests to scour the skies on an elephant and spin uncontrollably in a teacup. Tomorrowland, a futuristic land that gave guests a view of the future with vast possibilities and a fantastic look of objects and ideas of tomorrow. Walt Disney's dream theme park, Disneyland, became an instant success since its opening day. Within its first five years, the park blossomed in beauty as well as in attendance. In July 1960, the 20 millionth guests entered the Magic Kingdom's gates, with the 25 millionth guests entering in April. The new decade was upon the park, and changes began to unfold. Walt had once said that Disneyland would never be completed, and so the quest to upgrade and improve the park had begun. Main Street USA remained true to its theme, nostalgic and relic. It continued to capture the essence of the 1900s by utilizing transportation of that era. But in August of 1960, the fire wagon was retired and placed within the fire department as a display. Many of the Victorian style shops added to the antique look of Main Street USA. Shops such as Woolitzer's Music Hall which sold pianos and organs and often had a Disney employee play tunes for guests to sing and enjoy, eventually pulled its sponsorship in September of 1968. Shops such as the Hallmark Card Shop, Puffin's Bakery, and the Sunkiss Citrus House closed by the end of 1960. But Disneyland was all about growth and there were some changes brewing that would change the way entertainment was seen. In New York City, on Flushing Meadows Corona Park, a cityscape fair was about to open. It was deemed the 1964 to 1965 World's Fair, and the theme was Peace Through Understanding, and was cleverly dedicated to man's achievement on a shrinking globe in an expanding universe. It was here that Walt Disney was asked to display four attractions which were sponsored by such powerhouses as General Electric and the Ford Motor Company. 
One of the attractions built was an audio animatronic replica of Abraham Lincoln. This attraction was a life-size duplicate of Mr. Lincoln, which had him recite a convincingly sounding speech, and it looked like the real Abraham Lincoln. Originally, this attraction was to be placed in the Hall of Presidents within Liberty Street, but Liberty Street was never built, so instead, the great moments with Mr. Lincoln was housed at the Opera House. On December 18, 1965, Disney's Fantasy on Parade made its debut down Main Street. This parade gave guests a glimpse of their favorite characters such as Pluto and Goofy, and the Jungle Book crew, including King Louie and Baloo. Your attention, please. The Disneyland Limited, now arriving from a trip around Walt Disney's Magic Kingdom. The Santa Fe and Disneyland Railroad continue to give guests a rare view of the overall park, stopping at Frontierland and back around the Main Street Station. But on July 1st, 1966, a new prehistoric diorama was added to the Grand Canyon diorama. The Primeval World diorama showcased 46 prehistoric beasts that ranged from a gentle looking brontosaurus who was chewing on green vegetation fierce pterodactyl watching hungrily as guests chugged on by. To a few triceratops watching their little ones hatch from their eggs. But the most impressive part of this attraction is the 44 foot high Tyrannosaurus Rex attacking an angry Stegosaurus. This particular dramatic scene was taken from Disney's animated classic film Fantasia. Guests were also treated to a fun performance of Mickey Mouse leading the Disneyland band, which was still conducted by Bessie Walker. Main Street USA continued to capture the essence of the early American era. The vintage automobiles gave the Victorian backdrop depth and really gave guests a sense of time standing still. The prehistoric diorama journeyed back to the dinosaur age which widened guests' eyes with excitement as they safely tracked on down through the primeval world diorama. Even in the 60s, one could not help but feel the relic magic of good old Main Street. When we last left Adventureland in the 50s, the Jungle Cruise was the only attraction there. But change was coming. The once empty patch area of Disney's jungle was untraceable by the beginning of the 60s. 
Many of the flowers and plants began to flourish, and the trees grew tall and firm. Bob Maddy's mechanical animals were now surviving the harshness of Anaheim's sunny days, and large crowds began to line up to venture on this adventurous safari. So it made sense that Disney added on. In 1962, the Jungle Cruise received a new herd of elephants. These elephants gathered closely to bathe in the river and squirted water from their trunks. While another elephant sat below a waterfall and showered happily. These creations were designed by Imagineer Mark Davis, who had a knack for one setting humor. Still, the jungle would receive more animals in a 1964 expansion. This expansion included a pack of zebras, wildebeest, giraffe, gazelles, and many more wildlife curiously watching a lion and a lioness eat an unfortunate zebra. A small ways down, five explorers get the point that they are not welcome in the jungle. As the jungle continued to flourish and grow, Adventureland began to receive new buildings and attractions. One such building, the Plaza Pavilion Restaurant, which resided on Main Street, USA, was shared with a new South Sea restaurant called the Tunisian Terrace. On November 18, 1964, Adventureland was given a new tree, but not just any tree, the Swiss Family Robinson Treehouse. This treehouse complemented the theme land and derived from Disney's adventurous shipwreck film, The Swiss Family Robinson. On June 23, 1963, a new age of audio animatronics had arrived in Adventureland, known as the Enchanted Tiki Room. This 17-minute wonderment showcased 225 moving figures which included birds, tiki gods, and singing flowers, to name a few. As guests waited at the outside lobby, they were treated to a rare glimpse at many wooden tiki gods, such as Kuru, the mighty midnight dancer who becomes the life of the party, Hina Kuluna, the goddess of rain, Pele, the goddess of fire and volcano. Nagindi was the earth balancer. And Tangora, the father of all gods and goddesses. Once inside the attraction, guests are entertained by the many birds and flowers singing such catchy tunes as the Tiki 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 Room. Adventureland had certainly come a long way since the 50s. Its lavish jungle grew to be denser with tropical shrubbery. New animals frolic within Walt's jungle. and many birds flapped their colorful feathers joyfully as they sang to entertain one and all. The 60s brought new technology to Adventureland, making this tropical land memorable and adventurous. There was something different about Disneyland in the 60s. Aside from the new attraction in each of the lands, there was indeed a brand new land simply named New Orleans Square. New Orleans Square opened July 24, 1966, and is said to be designed in a French Quarter style based on Walt's love for New Orleans. Interestingly enough, there have been signs of a New Orleans feel before the land had ever been built in such attractions as the Mark Twain Steamboat, which cruised along the rivers of America. 
At $15 million, New Orleans Square became home to some quaint shops such as Crioli Cafe, Crystal D'Orleans, One of a Kind Shop, and Pirate's Arcade. But a pirate invasion found its way on March 18, 1967 by way of the Pirates of the Caribbean attraction. The Pirates of the Caribbean attraction began, as most theme rides do, with ideas on paper. To give this ride a comical look that audience could enjoy, Mark Davis began sketching out ideas that would look entertaining and yet blend in with the pirate theme. Walt Disney was very pleased with Mark's drawings and soon gave the green light to Roger Brogy and to the engineers to begin installing and programming the Pirates audio animatronics. A true fact has been noted that the Pirates of the Caribbean was originally slated to be a walkthrough which would have slowed down the entire show considerably. Something spooky began to emerge in 1963. It was a well-kept mansion on its exterior and had been talked about since 1961. It was, of course, the Haunted Mansion. In the late 50s, Walt was definitely saying, you know, it's kind of like a haunted house in, in here too. So um, there's, there's sketches of, of a haunted house. You know, usually they look more decrepit and, you know, like typical haunted house back then. Um, I, th I think it was kind of a thing where he wanted to walk people through this big house and there'd be special, you know, you'd stop in a room and there'd be something spectacular that happens or spooky and then you'd walk in another room. And I think his um, grand finale was going to be like a big wedding where um, there'd be a bride and a groom and all these famous monsters. I think he wanted um, some of the universal monsters in there and that kind of thing. happened was so they, they meanwhile found this house in Baltimore that they really love you know they I think they found it in a book in, in wed um, a book about Victorian decorations and um, there's a photo of this house and I think they went and found it and um, you know took some pictures and made they replicated it almost exactly so um, that's the house you see in Disneyland um, it's actually a, a house that did exist They, they did plan for it to be a walkthrough. Up until I think Walt Disney died, he still kind of thought it would be a walkthrough. Um, at that time, they were also trying to develop ride systems, you know, um, Bob Gurr and Aerodynamics. Um, the people that Wed worked with were working on these transportation systems. How do we get lots of people through these rides? And, um, you know, they had the boat system down for Small World and Pirates, and, you know, that was a good way to get a lot of people through and but the dark rides were still a little you know the, the Fantasyland rides were not that high of capacity so um, uh, Bob Gurr came up with this um, he's holding an apple one day and he said um, you know what if we had something that kind of you know round and could turn and you know that way they could instead of making the track bend all over they could have one track that the thing could move on but it could spin around so you could see left and right and up and down without needing this long track to take you in places. And so that became the Omnimover system, which is, they first used it, I think, in Adventure Through Inner Space, um, which was another ride at Disneyland where you would um, shrink, go through a microscope and go through an atom and through a snowflake. And um, it worked really well. So that's what they planned to put into the Haunted Mansion. So then sometime in the you know, mid-60s there, they, they came to this idea that the Haunted Mansion really needs to be something that we cart people through so that we can keep people moving and get a lot, uh, a larger capacity than a tour guide that you, you know, would have a group of however many people in room to room and you'd have to stop, do it, stop, 
do the singing and stuff. So um, that's where the ride vehicle, the dune buggy, came from. Definitely existed. Uh, there was, well, I mean, you see pictures of the Hatbox Ghost was one of the, one of the big um, press photos they released was Yale Gracie, who was the big special effects guy, working on this ghost holding a hat box that looked kind of like a skeleton with a big cloak on and a hat box. So that's a hat box ghost, and um, it's also in the record album. There's a, they talk about it and they show it. So it was clearly um, there, very very briefly. Um, what happened was, it was very near, the, the whole attic is a small set in the Haunted Mansion, and it was near to the Doom Buggy, and to the best of uh, most of the Imagineers I've talked to, kind of deciphering what happened is that it was probably too close to the Doom Buggy, so what was supposed to happen was this hatbox ghost had a, you know, a skull, and it would disappear and suddenly appear in this hatbox he was holding, and back and forth, so it was like his head was disappearing and appearing in this hatbox. Um, it was probably not very successful. I don't know, they probably could light it in a way that you could not see his, his head, you know, totally, and they probably thought, eh, this isn't really working. And, uh... and uh, well, the song goes through the whole Haunted Mansion. I mean, you, you don't really realize it, but the organ in the front, and then um, the tune that you hear in Madame Leota's chamber, the little airy tune, and then the big organ in the ballroom. It's all the same song playing over and over again. But really when you get to the graveyard is when it turns into this cool, you know, jazzy song, and there's all these ghosts, you know, kind of having a party, and there's a band, and the singing bus singing to it. Um, I just think that was a phenomenally developed scene. Um, and the way that you move through this, the graveyard and First you see the band, and then you see the, the you know the the bus singing, and then you see some of the other ghosts kind of having a party. Um, I just think it's put together really well. It's a really great little narration going on. So that's probably my favorite scene. When the time finally came to open the haunted gates, the mansion was cobwebbed from top to bottom and filled with aging dust. Within the confines of the Haunted Mansion, Mark Davis's one-sketch humor dominated the mansion, as well as Bill Justice's audio-animatronic corpse and Roly Crump's special spooky effects. Walt Disney had envisioned a joyful replica of New Orleans and was successful in doing so with quaint shops, southern foods, and jazzy music. He also created two thrilling attractions that chilled and thrilled. New Orleans Square was indeed a welcome part of the park. The 60s brought some changes within the wild wilderness of Frontierland. Most noticeable was the landscape. The rugged terrain of the western themed land changed, converged, and interacted with various parts of attractions. The addition of Nature's Wonderland on May 28, 1960 brought a big change to the overall landscape of Frontierland. Before the 60s, it was a barren field of desert and was only visited by guests who rode on the old Rainbow Ridge Mule Pack, the Stagecoach, and the Conestogo Wagons. But the Conestoga wagons quietly closed in 1959, as did the stagecoach in February of 1960, due to the horses getting spooked by the sounds of neighboring attractions, such as the whistling sound of the Mark Twain riverboat and the passing trains. The new seven-acre wonderland consisted of over 200 audio-animatronic animals, 156 plants, several nature-themed areas such as Bear Country, Beaver Valley, and the Living Desert, and a new mountain named Cascade Peak. The new Cascade Peak was seven stories high 
and assisted in sheltering the Bear Country and Beaver Valley scenes, and gave such mechanical animals as the mountain goats and various birds a place to sit on. To add to the Nature's Wonderland's beauty, the newly renamed train attraction, Mine Train Through Nature's Wonderland, made its debut at a cost of $1.8 million. The new revamped train ride chugged visitors through a spectacular tour through Bear Country, Beaver Valley, and the Living Desert. The train steamed by various animals such as turtles, snakes, and an old coyote. The western town of Rainbow Ridge now housed several new buildings, including the Gold Nugget Saloon, Horseshoe Cafe, Pioneer Hotel, and Nature's Wonderland Rainbow Ridge Outfitters. The journey was 0.3 miles long, and guests were not only treated to desert animals, but to some very colorful geysers that shot a stream of water high up into the air. Nature's Wonderland had become a beautiful desert to explore. The Rainbow Ridge Mule Pack stayed on in Frontierland, but received another name change of the pack mules through Nature's Wonderland. The new Mule Pack ride offered a better scenic view for guests to enjoy. The Indian Village was relocated to the Rivers of America's West Bank. More teepees were erected and on July 4, 1962, the Indian Trading Post was up and ready for business. The Indian war canoes continued to be a great way to exercise and to see a different viewpoint around Tom Sawyer's island. Children of all ages loved interacting with the real Native Americans, and the Indian tribes such as the Apache, Comanche, and the Navajo continued to attract large audiences to their ceremonial dances. Blending into the new theme land of New Orleans Square, the Mark Twain Riverboat continued to sail around Tom Sawyer's island. The guests could now view more animated animals and marvel at the new five-story mountain, Cascade Peak.
By the beginning of the 60s, the river rafts to Tom Sawyer's Island grew from two to four. They were now named Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn, Becky Thatcher, and Injun Joe. Each raft now carried an internal flotation tank and powered by four cylinders. Once on the island, guests could still enjoy exploring the caves, crossing the expansion bridge, and spinning on Castle Rock Ridge. Frontierland really captured the rugged west. Throughout the 60s, guests were treated to the splendor of nature's wonderland, where the mine train traveled closely to the new Cascade Mountain. and the mule trail ride revealed several scenic wonders and continued to introduce real Indians to excited children. Frontierland really caught the aura of the Old West in such a way that it had guests eager to explore the trails and the island. The magic of soaring through the air in a pirate ship or plundering down a rabbit hole with Alice was a thrill of a lifetime, as was riding on the back of a flying elephant or getting dizzy after spinning round and round on the Mad Hatter's tea party. So it stands to reason as to why Fantasyland in the 60s remained untouched from the 50s. There was some minimal changes, like the adventurous travels of Alice in Wonderland ride dropped from a D ticket to a C ticket. The story book land attraction shot up from a C ticket to a D ticket. In 1961, few of the Fantasyland attractions received a makeover. One such ride was the Peter Pan Flight. During the park's first opening years, it became apparent that there was a problem with the track system. Once the sailing ship soared past Wendy's bedroom out into London, the boats could be made to rock side to side, but was reworked during its makeover. Also upgraded was the ride sound system, animated characters, lighting, and scenery. Snow White's Adventures also received an upgrade during 1961. A team of Imagineers, led by Yale Gracie, added additional scenes and effects to the dark ride, including sound effects like birds chirping, leaves blowing, and lightning streaking. There were also placed various poses of the Wicked Witch, and lightning was given to every evil tree, causing the trees to look more menacing. Mr. Toad's Wild Ride was in need of repainted areas, as the 1955 opening had the ride painted in a rush, so in 1961 many of the floor's props were repainted. In December of 1960, five years after Hook's famous ship opened, a new backdrop surrounded it, known as Skull Rock. The ship was now placed within a turquoise lagoon, and on the northeastern shore stood a large 30-foot stone skull. The rock's sculpted skull had an eerie open mouth with jagged teeth and haunted eye sockets that being dark green at night. Waterfalls poured out between its mouth and the back side of its head. Skull Rock definitely added visual depth to those who dined within Hook's Galley. 
and in September of 1969, the Chicken of the Sea pirate ship was renamed the Captain Hook's Galley. The name change occurred because Chicken of the Sea passed ownership of the restaurant to Disneyland. By the mid-60s, the Skyway to Fantasyland and Tomorrowland had changed its buckets from the original round buckets to a more rectangle shape. Each new bucket could now hold four to five guests comfortably and still offer a great bird's eye view of the rides below. On March 27, 1961, Snow White's Wishing Well Grotto was placed on the right hand side of Sleeping Beauty's castle. The grotto consisted of a statuette of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and a wishing well. It has been noted that Snow White is considerably larger than the dwarfs, so the diners placed Snow White up in the background while the dwarfs were placed on the bottom front. This gives the proper illusion of all eight images correctly perspective. It has also been noted that all the money that guests tossed into the wishing well was given to charity. On May 28, 1966, Fantasyland received a very special attraction, one that would have guests singing its song all the way back to their hotel. The attraction was simply called It's a Small World. Guests would first board one of the many boats and slowly drift towards an open building where the memorable Sherman Brothers song, It's a Small World, would begin to play. On the right and left side of the boat were stages filled with 500 dolls dressed in their cultural attire. It's a Small World was originally one of the four attractions that Walt Disney built for the 1964-1965 World's Fair. It seemed only fitting that such a joyous ride be sent to Fantasyland. Fantasyland in the 60s had become a magical wonderment where children could laugh as they soared high into the sky on a flying elephant or scream with joy at the dizziness of a spinning teacup. Children of all ages could become a villainous pirate on Hook's galley yelling ARG while swaying a sword or scour the whole theme land from the skyway. Fantasyland, it seemed, had kept its charm. The idea of Tomorrowland was simple, create a world of tomorrow, today. But that would prove too difficult to do. It was in fact Walt Disney himself who summed up the problem perfectly when he stated, Tomorrow is a heck of a thing to keep up with. The 60s brought many changes in Tomorrowland, more so than anywhere else in the park. Many of the exhibits such as Space Station X-1, the Aluminum Hall of Fame, and the bathroom of tomorrow closed within the first year of the 60s. While the flight circle and the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea exhibit shut down in 1966. There were also a few props that were torn down in 1966 such as Monsanto's House of the Future, TWA's Moonliner Rocket,
and the clock of the world. Though changes within Tomorrowland took away some of the exhibits and dismantled a few of the props, there were some favorable progress. In June of 1960, Circa Rama's 360 movie theater received a new film entitled America the Beautiful. On November 4, 1964, Circa Rama changed its name to Circle Vision and again to Circa Vision 360 on June 25, 1967. On August 6, 1961, Tomorrowland received a new attraction called Flying Saucer. This unique ride had 64 saucers gliding guests around an arena, which pumped up air from the floor. To travel in these flying saucers, you only needed to lean to the right or to the left, and the hovercraft moved in that direction. The technology for the flying saucer wasn't quite ready for this ride at the time, so on September 5, 1966, the ride floated to the ground one last time and was quietly put away. The monorail continued to be a successful mode of transportation. So successful, in fact, that on April 1, 1961, the monorail extended its route to the Disneyland Hotel. Also new were the Mark II monorails, now in gold, which carried a fourth cab, allowing 108 guests to ride smoothly through the park. Most noticeable on the front cab was the bubble dome for a lucky guest to peer out of. In 1968, another updated monorail was added to the track, the Mark III. A fifth cab was also added, allowing 127 guests to enjoy the aerial view. The quest for a better running Autotopia vehicle continued with the sleeker looking model, dubbed the Mark VI in 1963. The new Mark VI had a light frame and gone were the side rails, but the track now had a new guide rail to prevent riders from sideswiping cars. The lightweight frame began to cause problems as collisions tended to bend the frame of the vehicle. So in 1967, the Mark VII was introduced with a stronger frame and a Corvette body. The Astro Jets were given a new name change in 1964 to the Tomorrowland Jets, but then it flew its last circular flight on September 5, 1966. The newly remodeled Tomorrowland in 1967 gave a rebirth to the rocket ride by first giving it a new name, Rocket Jets and placing it three stories up on top of another attraction site. The new rockets were impressively black and white and had a NASA looking feel. With the remodeling of Tomorrowland scheduled, the rocket to the moon closed its doors in September of 1966. But when the dust cleared from the new Tomorrowland in 1967, a new space-age attraction called Flight to the Moon emerged. Gone was the iconic TWA Moonliner rocket prop, but guests could still fly to the moon. One of Tomorrowland's popular attractions was the Submarine Voyage, in which guests could board a gray sub and travel the ocean world, visiting aquatic life and discovering the world beneath the sea. With the world of audio animatronics improving, a major refurbishing began in 1967 in which Mark Davis restaged many of the gags, making the voyage a better ride. Also seen as of 1965 were live mermaids on a rock lagoon, waving to the guests. But they were removed in 1967 as some of the guests would hop over the rails and swim out to meet them. The new Tomorrowland brought many entertaining attractions, such as the Carousel of Progress, sponsored by General Electric. The show of 32 audio animatronics highlighted four decades of American life. It was originally titled Progress Land at the 1964-1965 World's Fair. 
the relaxing ride of the people mover in which a mobile tram guided you through some of the back scenes of various rides was inspired by another attraction that Disney built for the 1964-1965 New York World's Fair named the Ford Magic Skyway. The last attraction to be assembled in Tomorrowland came in 1967 with the catchy title Adventures Through Inner Space. The Monsanto engineers and Claude Coates designed an adventure ride that shrank guests small as an atom to explore snowflakes, water molecules, and attempt to peer through an atom. The scientist's voice was played by Paul Fries, who would eventually play the ghost host for The Haunted Mansion in 1969. Interestingly enough, the suggested name for this attraction was Magic Microscope and Microworld. Keeping ahead of the future is a challenging task indeed. Somehow Walt Disney managed to stay one foot ahead of the future within Tomorrowland. A new design and an additional cab continue to keep the monorail looking futuristic. While a stronger frame made the Mark 7s more durable. Great attractions such as the People Mover and Adventures Through Inner Space gave guests a memorable good time that will eventually bring them back in the future. Disneyland had grown since it opened in 1955. It remained magical but grew to be twice as enchanting and instilled fond memories with every passing moment. Main Street USA carried on its nostalgic appeal of the 1900s. It managed to place the historic Lincoln attraction perfectly within its theme. And the vintage modes of transportation remained iconic from the old era and were a thrill to ride down to the enchanted castle. Main Street gave guests a rare opportunity to enjoy the harmonic tunes of the damper dance and the prehistoric journey through the primeval world diorama. It was indeed a jolly good time. The jungles of Adventureland flourished throughout the 60s, creating a dense and mysterious backdrop for the themed land. Within a decade, more wild animals were created to the expanding Jungle Cruise. and a large tree sprouted on the right of the attraction. It became home for hundreds of talking birds and to the hip swaying entertainers. It continued to be more than adventurous by giving guests more than they expected. The jazzy sound of New Orleans Square were irresistible to ignore. It was a welcoming sound that really added to the joyfulness that Disneyland created and blended in flawlessly within the 60s. With the beastly pirates residing in the Caribbean, ranting and singing the dark and drunken song of Yo Ho Ho, it quickly became a favorite among guests. While the haunted mansion brought chills and thrills with each passing frightful image.
New Orleans Square had found its way into Walt Disney's park and into our hearts. With the western theme land renovated to a grander scale, Frontierland seemed less barren. The nine-minute train ride delighted guests as they rolled through the arid desert, viewing the much-needed addition of plants and critters. It was also a pleasant sight to see the sculpted mountain of Cascade Peak. Frontierland had grown to be a better western wonderment in the 60s, making it a fun land to visit. Fantasyland is the heart of Disneyland. It is what children dream of when told that they are going to the park. It's easy to see why, as the attractions are aimed for children to enjoy with their parents. The madness of the spinning teacups or the flight with Dumbo creates a bond that no one can resist. It is essentially a ride of joy when chugging along with Casey Jr. Or a sight of awe while admiring the cuteness of every doll. Or even exciting while 60 feet up in the air overlooking the beauty of Walt's imagination. It will forever be a fantasy come true. Taking a step into the future can be fun. Where else can a guest soar across an arena in a flying saucer? Or fly the skies in a rocket ship? In Tomorrowland, one can easily relax in the futuristic mode of transportation using the people mover and enjoy the shrinking of oneself to explore the worlds of molecules and atoms. It brings guests close to the portals while discovering a world under the sea. The world of Tomorrowland brings the promise of a better world tomorrow. Disneyland is just as much a part of you as it was to Walt Disney. Together we share the joy and laughter that the park brings and thus the innocence of the park remains intact. In the beginning of the 60s, there were barren areas of the park and some attractions that needed some minor attention. But within 10 years, the park began to shape into what Walt had in mind. On December 15, 1966, Walt Disney passed away. But he left behind not just a memory of characters that we all love in many of his motion pictures, but a place where we can visit and feel the presence of a man with a dream to make us happy. Walt once said, I'm not interested in pleasing the critics. I'll take my chances pleasing the audience. And so he has successfully done so in a place called Disneyland.